Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Kelly here. Um, not only is Kelly a member of our board of uh, board for the Passive House Alliance Chicago chapter, but she's also uh, an architect and principal at HPZS Architects. She's a co-chair of the IA Chicago Committee on the Environment. She's NCARB, Well AP, Living Future Pro Accredited Professional, um, as well as a CPHC. So we're in good hands with Kelly and um, take it away. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Kelly Moynihan. Like Tom said, I am first and foremost an architect, have been for a while, but I uh, have <laughs> some credentials at the end of my name that suggest I have a passion for sustainability um, and, and implementing that in my practice at HPZS. Uh, we're an architecture firm in Chicago, specializing in historic preservation and high performance design, which is a nice intersection for something like Passive House. We deal a lot with existing buildings and retrofits and breathing new life into them for um, you know, uh, a way to fight the climate crisis, but allow you know, existing treasures to continue on um, in, a, in a new uh, new lifetime with new technology. So uh, we're gonna do Passive House 101 today, which is sort of an, a high level 30,000 feet introduction to passive buildings. Um, you do get a one FIA CEU today for those of you who are Passive House consultants, which is always great. Um, you can report that on the FIAS.org website. Um, so today we're gonna do um, just an overview of what is FIAS um, and dive into sort of the principles of Passive House design. Um, we'll save questions towards the end. Um, but as, as Tom said, you know, this is sort of a kickoff to the year for lots of different programming uh, surrounding uh, Passive House. And so I would encourage you to, if you've got super technical questions or project specific questions, this won't be your only opportunity to sort of discuss those with other members of the chapter, experts in the field, et cetera. So we're gonna start with a overall, what is FIAS? And so overall, FIAS seeks to drastically reduce the contribution of building energy consumption through passive building. FIA certifies uh, buildings, people, and products, which maybe doesn't make sense at the start, but we'll get into that. Um, FIA works with existing peer institutions, such as the U.S. Department of Energy, Zero Energy Ready Homes, the Zero Energy Ready Homes Program, the Water Sense Program, Indoor Air Plus Program, et cetera. So it's backed up by a lot of other organizations that already really know this stuff. Um, FIAS fosters and is supported by a community of the education and collaboration, which is the FIAS Alliance that I am a, uh, on the board of directors uh, for the Chicago chapter, which we all encourage you to get involved, as, as both Tom and I have said. Um, FIAS also provides, as an organization, consulting services, which include red, red flag review or a quick review of your project to see, like, is this really a good fit for FIAS? So doing some feasibility studies, also does thermal bridge analysis and hydrothermal analysis, which is technical speak for how you really get into the details um, for passive house design. Uh, I wanna start off by saying that FIAS doesn't just certify houses, despite what the name might suggest. Um, it's a standard that can apply to many different building types, single family homes, certainly, but also multifamily residential, non-residential buildings like commercial or industrial buildings um, and both new construction and retrofits. So it, it can do it all. It's not specific to housing, uh, which is a common misconception. Uh, FIAS general, or it is based on the idea that it provides a climate specific building standard. So it's specific to where it is. It's not just a blanket um, set of requirements regardless of where it is, because we all know the climate is different in different places. And so it has to address different targets and peaks and loads differently. Um, and so it customizes the approach for a wide range of clients, climates in the US and, and beyond. Uh, so let's start first with what is passive building. And so it starts not just with um, enter, you know, a lot of people might think of passive house or FIAS and think of very technical things, building science energy modeling, stuff like that, which it certainly is all of those things, but passive building is really the idea of um, 
approaching a project with what can we do in the design that actually reduces the energy uh, demand just by the choices we make in designing. So you'll see in these two graphs here, you have a typical building on the left and passive building on the right. Um, and so these charts represent the annual energy consumption of two different buildings, one being the conventional and one being the passive. Lighting, appliance, domestic hot water loads are consistent throughout the year. Heating and cooling varies based on where the building is and its climate. The total energy, uh, annual energy consumption is the area that's underneath the red and blue curve uh, combined. And the total peak power uh, consumption is the bold black dot at the peak of the curves, um, which is the most amount of energy spent at any given moment during the year. And so the idea is that if you're, make, you're using passive strategies in the design, you actually are reducing the need for heating energy and cooling energy. And so that becomes your new baseline. And so uh, I think before you get into the, the, tech, the technical details of passive house design, really it's a challenge to start the project at the beginning of thinking about what are the passive strategies, what are the choices that I can make that are not about systems or um, maybe expensive solutions, but just things about orientation or how much glazing do I have, things like that. So um, passive house building delivers all kinds of things. And a lot of times it's associated with energy and savings, dollar savings with that. But it does a lot of other things that I think are really important to talk about which are include a healthy interior because these buildings are, uh, we think about the envelope and how uh, things are coming in and out of the building. It creates a more healthy interior, which a lot of people care about, especially in recent years, post COVID um, and how ventilation works, uh, which if you have a very insulated building and it's more regulated throughout the year, you don't have peaks and valleys of hot and cold. And so you have better, more consistent comfort inside. Um, and, you know, with doing these things and creating a, a very airtight and insulated envelope, you also increase the resilience of your building. It will last longer because you're thinking about how not just air is getting out of, in and out of your building, but water is getting in and out of your building. And so that's something that contributes to long-term affordability and durability over time. So it might have a initial investment that is a little bit higher than your baseline building, but overall it's gonna last longer and perform better. And so therefore save you money over time, which is what everybody really wants to talk about. We're talking about making choices yeah, around uh, buildings. So um, a little bit of history on passive building standards. Uh, the passive building methodology was first developed on a theoretical level in the US uh, at the University of Illinois, which was called the, in, in a project called the Low Cal House in 1974. Um, the first passive buildings were constructed in North America, and then the idea sort of floated over to Europe uh, with PHI, the Passive House Institute. Um, they formalized the method into a certification system with metrics in 1996. Um, and then FIAS created the, uh, the climate-specific certification here in the United States, uh, and that standard was curated in 2015, which is applicable to a wider range of climate zones throughout the U.S. and beyond. And because the United States is a country that has all different types of climates, it was we couldn't just sort of take the model that was in Europe um, and use it here because there's just too much diversity um, in temperature and humidity in the United States that aren't seen in other countries of just smaller scale. Um, and so, so we kind of had to develop our own standard that worked here. Um, so the main business, uh, building principles around passive house and dynamics. Uh, we're gonna kind of run through a few slides and sort of break it down into the high level pieces of uh, what you have to consider when you're thinking about passive building principles. So I'm gonna run through those very quickly here. So you have the first two, which are kind of around the ideas of thermal control, which are high performance insulation and thermal bridge in elimination. So what that means is we're creating a really solid, uh, well-performing uh, sweater for our buildings and that it is, uh, we're thinking about how well it's insulated. It requires more insulation. Um, and so thinking about then what are the punctures through that envelope when we're thinking about a thermal bridge 
um, and reducing those and eliminating them wherever possible, because those are uh, weak points where uh, temperature transfer can happen. And then we're also talking, we also have to think a lot about air control. So while we are creating a super insulated exterior envelope, um, we also have to think about how tight and how, um, it, when we're thinking about air tightness, like the leakiness level. So when you think about where those punctures are for windows and doors, what are the detailing where assemblies meet and how do we make sure we're, we're reducing uh, thermal transfers at those zones best we can. And that's done through um, certain uh, detailing choices uh, in your envelope. But also with a super airtight insulated envelope, you also have to think, well, I still need to let this building breathe. And so we have to be considering how the building is ventilated um, either mechanically or passively. Um, and so you have to get really sophisticated uh, analysis with ventilation that comes with a super insulated envelope. And then radiation control. So our bit, you know, where a lot of energy comes in and out of a building is through glass. Um, and as much as we all love uh, glass in our buildings, to be able to see in, in and out, we have to be thinking about what is the performance of those windows, both in the glass and at the frame. Um, you know, the, the, the specifications we choose in windows uh, really, really matter when it comes to the, the total energy consumption for that building. So as I mentioned, the, the, uh, if you're designing a perfect passive house, you really want to think about continuous insulation. So that super insulated sweater that I was sp speaking about, you want to think about it continuing around all the entire profile of the building, from the roof to the walls to the foundation, um, and trying to create as, as little to no interruptions of that uh, transitions between those assemblies as you can. But it's not possible to make sure that it's fully, fully uh, enclosed because then there'd be no way in and out of the building. So really being careful about how we're insulating and where. Um, so building code obviously dictates our minimum R values or insulation levels for buildings, uh, but passive building uses energy modeling to determine the right amount and the right kind of insulation to meet those conservation goals. Um, the pictures you see here, the infrared image on the right shows a row house where one unit was a retrofit to a FIA standard, guess which one, and then the red, yellow, orange, like very colorful one is showing rapid heat loss in and out of that building versus the blue purple one, which is the retrofit one where you've got the airtight, super insulated envelope is blue and purple showing very little heat loss. And so that's the goal is that we're controlling how much um, heat is leaving or entering the building by creating a continuous, as best we can, insulated envelope. So just further demonstrating that idea, uh, as you think about, it's, it's one thing is to think about the insulation. The other thing is to think about uh, break points in that envelope, which is a thermal bridge. So thermal bridging occurs when a conductive material, whether it's concrete, wood, steel, usually a structural element, passes through without interruption between the interior and the exterior of the building. So that's allowing you know, heat to go either in or out of the building very easily just through conductive uh, uh, transfer. Um, thermal bridging is remedied by creating a thermal break. And that's done in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of products that allow you to do a literal break in the, in the structure that uh, allows a stop gap for heat to be passing through on either side of it. Um, FIA certification certainly allows for thermal bridging because sometimes it can't be avoided, especially in a retrofit condition if the, it's already something that exists there. But it's something that has to be accounted for in the energy model when thinking about what 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 heat is leaving or entering your building. So here in the images, you have Aqua Tower in Chicago. Many are familiar. Uh, it's a lovely building to look at, very artful. But each of those concrete balconies that's creating that wave effect is actually a giant thermal bridge that's going from the interior to the exterior and vice versa. And there's no break whatsoever. So I've been in that building and it's either really cold or really hot all the time, or the mechanical system are having to run on overdrive, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. So the minim the minimization of thermal breaks is really, really key to keeping your 
if you're going to go through the effort of insulating your building and and frankly the premium of extra insulation you don't want to ruin that by then putting a bunch of uh, ways for heat to go in and out of your building through thermal bridges so this is just more imagery on um, infrared imaging showing kind of how uh, the difference between a well insulated no thermal break envelope is versus the other. Uh, they sh it shows the importance of high performance windows as well. So which is, as I mentioned before, is a uh, place where certainly a lot of heat can be leaving or entering your building. Uh, the left image is the inconsistent critical heat loss at existing windows, which show up as red. Um, thermal bridges at the roof overhang and the right image shows the reduced consistent even heat loss so it's easier to predict um, and no thermal bridges so just more uh, examples of why that's important so let's move on to ventilation uh, so conventional non-air type buildings which is your typical code building exhibit random ventilation so air is leaving all the time in many directions um, and how you usually make up for that is you're spending more money on your mechanical systems to help control that, which is what we're trying to avoid. In a controlled ventilation scenario in an airtight building envelope, that ensures that the air exchanging between the inside and the outside is only from intended locations. And so it's not random and can be modeled and predicted. Um, in random ventilation, it's just, it's, it's impossible to predict the air infiltration. And so therefore you're energy demands are all over the place and usually higher than they need to be. Um, so the controlled ventilation definitely increases the need though to bring in some sort of mechanically uh, serve it, served fresh air option. So from the outside, so that could be through an HRV or an ERV, which we can talk more about here. Um, so in balanced ve ventilation, your heat recovery ventilation or an HRV is essential for a passive building. Um, this helps reclaim the heat from the exhaust air that's on its way out of the building and then captures it back and uses that heat to pre-treat incoming fresh air. So it's it's sort of free energy to use that you already have expended. And rather than let it just leave your building, you get to reuse it um, and help then lower the demand on your systems to preheat the incoming fresh air. Um, enthalpy or energy recovery ventilation and ERV regulates the humidity in addition to the heat. Um, HRVs don't do that. So by using an HRV or an ERV, less energy is needed overall to heat or cool the interior spaces. Um, with airtight construction, the building envelope, need, I mean, it needs to be airtight for any of this to work. Um, so we we think about uh, if you'll see the the house diagram here, there's a, a thin red line that goes around the perimeter of the building from the roof to the walls to the um, foundation. And we want to think about that as a continuous air tightness strategy um, all, all, all across assemblies. And so FIAS actually, the certification has an air tightness limit of 0.06 CFM um, per square foot, which is five times lower than what is required by building code uh, via IECC 2021. Um, this air tightness requirement, while seemingly very stringent, actually provides a lot of durability within the assembly. So it's actually protecting the investment you're making in the additional insulation required to achieve passive house certification. Um, and it also supports that balanced ventilation we previously talked about and reduces the overall heat loss through infiltration. Um, we talked a little bit about windows before, but uh, after when you're thinking about the envelope, you can't forget about picking the right windows. So optimized windows uh, refers to the idea of the correct balance between heat loss through the window and heat gain coming into the um, building through sun exposure, uh, also through the window. So this is obviously specific to climate. Um, you know, different different areas of the country have different. Um, ways of thinking about this and, and how you might select your windows. It also is impacted by what your building type is and the orientation of your building. And so again, when you're dealing with a retrofit situation, you're sort of boxed into some of these choices regarding type and orientation. But in new construction, you want to be thinking about this at the forefront um, in so optimizing the building for uh, solar gain and thinking about heat loss 
as well as how you might optimize it for solar renewables. We'll get into that later. But windows account for the largest amount of heat loss per square foot in a building. So your window specification is really, really important. But I want to stress the fact that a lot of times people think you have to spend a ton of money on your windows and use passive house certified windows. And you should. You should always explore that option. But it is possible to achieve for FIA certification with both double and triple pane glass, um, though historically a triple pane option is, is used most frequently. Um, the thermal analysis diagram in the bottom left here uh, show the various mullion profiles um, that show the efficiency of a thermally broken frame. So a passive house certified window is going to like have done this modeling and thinking about how heat transfer is actually going through at the frame, which is usually the weakest, weakest point of a window. So, but I, I, I say this in that you can use a window that isn't passive house certified, but you just have to account for what that loss might be in the frame when you're doing your energy modeling. Um, so when you do all these steps I already uh, mentioned and you get to the point where, okay, now let's design the mechanical system. Hopefully what you've done is actually reduce the overall um, energy needs. And so therefore you're minimizing the mechanical systems required to heat and cool the building. So they become minimized as, as a result of drastically lowering that peak heating and cooling load, doing those passive strategies, those ones you can just do by making, you know, really uh, good design decisions and having the foresight to do so. Um, certainly FIAS promotes using all electric systems as we're, you know, fans of decarbonization over here. Um, for And also it allows for maximum energy efficiency, but it doesn't mean you can't use um, other other means of um, of energy other than electric. Um, so there's there's lots of choices here. I think that you could do a whole uh, session on selecting mechanical systems, but I think the message that Fias and and certainly I want to drive home is that part of uh, you know going after passive house design and and certifying a building should be thinking about decarbonization because it's not just about savings for that building, but for you know, solving the bigger problems at, at stake. So the previous slides looked at kind of the foundational principles of passive building. The next few slides are gonna focus on how we optimize these characteristics to provide a cost um, optimized climate specific uh, pathway to certification. So like I said earlier, the FIA standard is climate specific. So it, it really is targeted based on where the, the building is. And it prioritizes the passive building principles first, um, which helps guides builders to uh, have success in the design and construction of a high performance building. Um, so conservation first, and then sort of uh, that, that feeds into the quality of, of the building, uh, gets, you, gets you towards net zero. So there are four main certification requirements. Uh, there's space conditioning targets, which are climate specific, um, the air tightness uh, level of the envelope, uh, the on-site quality assurance and quality control, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, and source energy target, which we will also talk about more. Uh, the space conditioning targets, both annual and peak demands um, are variable based on climate. Uh, the building size, as well as occupant density, dwelling unit size, and the financial investment, which is includes upfront costs versus operational costs. So when you're thinking about setting your targets, there is this thing called the sweet spot. Um, so you could spend a lot of uh, initial capital to, uh, you know, do a lot of these strategies, but that you want to be weighing that against uh, actually what the performance is of that. And so what is the sweet spot between what your capital investment and your mortgage will be uh, as, as and when you're looking at your utility bill. So space conditioning targets are set using cost optimization and pinpointing that sweet spot I, I was saying for the investment of the conservation, what those strategies might be. So more and more insulation can certainly be added to the building. You can make those walls as thick as you want, I suppose. There's always gonna be a point of diminishing returns when you're looking at that upfront cost versus the operational cost, which is your electricity use. So the maximum amount of the investment 
um, in conservation before the point of diminishing returns is hit, um, you know, that the next conservation measure may save energy, but it could increase the total cost. The total cost is really equal to the cost of the upfront saving measures plus the cost to operate the building um, over a year for the life of a building. And hopefully by doing all these things, they ideally minimize over time. So, you know, when you're thinking about doing this for a project, there is sort of that, how much, how much do we want to do um, upfront in the capital investment and the design choices that are made both in the envelope and the mechanical systems versus what's, what's the payoff? Because that's always going to be the conversation you have either with yourself or your clients and whatnot. So it's, it, it, there is, there is sort of that sweet spot. And that's also based on climate and based on the type of the building, the size of the building. Um, FIAS has over a thousand individual climate sets with, with um, unique design conditions all over the U.S. and, and outside the country. Uh, the cost optimization exercise is, is applied to various climate zones and building types and sizes to determine um, what the FIAS design targets should be. So let's talk about other quality related requirements. In addition to the climate specific space conditioning targets, um, FIAS certification ensures the highest quality of uh, the highest quality building envelope. So FIAS quality assurance and quality control or QAQC um, is based on the existing U.S. certification systems and a third party inspection of a FIAS certified rater, which is another part of your FIAS team or your passive house team when you're when you're um, pursuing a passive house building. Um, and so this allows you to not just design something on paper and say, yeah, that's pretty good and it'll hit those targets. You actually have to prove that it did it, which sets it apart from other types of um, high performance standards and certifications. The, the, the proof is really in the pudding. And so, and you do that with a third party. So it can't be uh, the CPHC necessarily or the builder. You have to bring someone else in to really check your work. Um, so in addition to the FIAS related inspection, a FIAS rater will verify that project to make sure that it's in, in compliance with Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready Homes, um, and uh, EPA water sense, as well as indoor indoor air plus certifications. That's it. Um, so these co these these side by side programs provide sort of a foundation for quality control across all the systems, as well as the envelope, appliances, everything like that, uh, to assure that the quality control process and FIAS can lean on those uh, robust uh, alternative U.S. systems for quality control standards. So it's it's using already good frameworks to test against that in the field uh, to make sure that the, the building is performing as designed for those savings. So let's talk a little bit about renewable energy and how that works with FIAS because a lot of times Passive House is paired with an idea of trying to get to net zero energy. So passive building focuses certainly on the passive measures as we've already talked about. And it's certainly the first essential step towards a net zero building. Um, as we move through, through the next couple slides, we'll look at the concept of a net zero building and how those relate to FIAS. So first, I want to go over what is site versus source energy. Um, site energy includes only the energy that's consumed on site, so proximate, you know, in the property boundary of the building. So that includes the lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, hot water, plug loads, appliances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that it's actually taking to make that building function. Um, but if you think a little bit bigger than that, and realistically, a building takes more energy than just what it's using in its property boundary, which is where we talk about source energy, which includes all of that site energy, but also includes the energy it took to produce and deliver that energy or electricity from wherever it was made all the way to your building, because that's not nothing. And it's something that should be accounted for when we're thinking about the carbon use of our buildings. So FIAS actually focuses on source energy rather than just site energy, um, because it's a more comprehensive, holistic look at what the actual energy demand is for that building to be in operation. 
Um, so the final certification requirement is a net source energy target. This net is the net of a renewable energy production, uh, all of which would be an offset for the zero certification, which we'll get into the differences in a minute, but also some is counted for the core certification for FIAS. Um, source energy targets are set differently based on a residential or a non-residential project. Um, residential uh, projects are based on a per person limit, um, which varies based on the FIA certification selected, whether you're going with core or zero versus non-residential uh, uh, projects have a different way of calculating that. Um, so let's talk about, again, conservation first. So FIAS always stresses conservation first approach when we're thinking about getting to net zero. So you do that through all the strategies we talked about to really make this a great, uh, well-designed building, minimize mechanical systems. Therefore, we're minimizing our site energy. Um, and before we even think about what the renewable path is. So this is important when considering the impact of the building beyond the site boundary towards the electric grid and how that's, uh, you know, when we're thinking about renewable energy, um, how that either plugs in or out of that grid, et cetera. So the FIAS core certification is based on a per person net source energy reduction based on a global fair share principle. Um, the FIAS core also focuses on the foundation that pass on the foundation of passive building principles but only requires renewables if the fair share source energy target is not met. The FIAS zero certification is based on a net zero energy consumption per person, which is the total renewable energy production equal or exceeding energy consumption. Um, and the FIAS zero certification always requires renewable energy and is compatible with all renewable energy sources on or off site. So it doesn't have to be necessarily in your project boundary, but if you're going to hit the zero target, you actually have to get to zero, which is obviously going to require a renewable strategy. Um, okay, so I think this is a build on. Yes, here we go. So the FIA certification framework is intentionally structured to first prioritize quality, health, durability, and safety, which is done through air tightness, moisture control requirements, and the third party uh, prerequisite programs. Next, we turn to passive conservation strategies, which is the space conditioning demand and load targets. Then we focus on the um, active conservation strategies. Should be populating next, maybe there it is. Okay, um, which uh, so the active conservation strategies were, which are the more efficient equipment, minimize mechanical systems to meet the FIAS core targets, and then after all of that's applied. Uh, we turn towards a renewable strategy to offset the total energy use. So FIAS core caps off at the conservation strategies, um, which is still a, a great feat in itself. We don't need to minimize it. That's still not a great uh, uh, pathway to take, but FIAS zero sort of takes it to the top to be a net zero building, which will require renewable energy. So a new, newish alternative approach for FIAS core uh, in 2021, FIAS released a new prescriptive path to help streamline the adoption of passive buildings, so make it more accessible to more project teams and project typologies. Uh, the scope is limited to all electric family home, or so, sorry, all electric single family homes. Um, so it's a uh, it's it's a good way to have a slightly different. I don't want to say less stringent requirements, but different requirements to hit it for an all electric single family home versus something. Uh, we have to stick to the normal core path for a multifamily home. So the core family, I think this just talks about what I already was going over, but the I think that what shows the difference between the core and the uh, zero pass is that this uses a slightly different approach to achieve the same goal, which is still using conservation first um, strategies towards the idea of net zero, but doesn't necessarily take it all the way there through renewables. Um, so this slide is showing us the, the core prescriptive requirements and how those are different. So the prescriptive path requirements are split into the following 10 categories, scope limitations, air tightness, compactness, solar protection, therm I mean, I don't need to read all these for you, but 
10 of those. Um, the gray is sort of the, the gray box here is the general scope. The navy boxes two through seven are sort of the passive conservation strategies and eight and nine are the teal ones are the active conservation strategies. So these requirements themselves fall into three groups, universal, uh, a universal requirement, a building specific requirement and a climate spe specific requirement. Um, and so I think the, the goal of FIA is to introduce this new uh, prescriptive pathway is to allow uh, project teams to use this for single family. Um, this, this is an image here for, it's uh, a snapshot of the tool that's used to display the prescriptive path requirements that are still climate specific. Um, the requirements are more outlined better in the prescriptive checklist, which you can access on fias.org. Um, so this is a free tool that can be found there. Um, I, I suggest that it's a good way to test out, you know, feasibility at the start of a project for um, if you're thinking about FIA score. Um, it shows recommended R values, window values, minimum mechanical efficiencies based on your location, size, occupancy. So it's nice. It's a nice gut check at the start of the pro, uh, start of a project um, to help you move forward with um, passive house uh, design strategies. Um, this was developed in 2021 for the prescriptive path, but like I said, I think it's a good thing to use kind of regardless of the project type or what certification path you're thinking about. Um, so now let's talk a little bit more about who's actually doing this work. What I said at all is a lot, you know, it's um, doing Passive House is challenging um, and requires the expertise of a lot of people. But the good news is, is that there are lots of different ways to um, get get skills to be involved in a passive house project. Um, and FIAS uh, get, has certifications for different people as well as projects. And so the first is a certified passive house consultant, which I am one of those. I have been one since 2018, I think, which um, is a, a for an individual that can actually do the modeling um, as well as the consulting of what the choices should be made for um, the design of a project and helps get that thing certified both in the uh, preliminary design certification as well as final certification. Um, it, it's a person that should be involved early in a design process. Like I said, they do the energy modeling and they help verify the compliance as the project march, marches along with FIAS. Um, also, we have certified builders. So these are the people that actually know how to put the thing together to meet these standards, which is very, very um, important. I mean, if you're going to pursue a passive house building, I'll say as an architect, the first thing I want to do is try and find a builder who already knows how to do it. There are, they, they do exist and it's it's gaining a lot of traction in the market. Um, but I think it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't encourage contractors you work with to maybe go through this certification with FIAS, which helps them learn about what those sort of air tightness requirements are going to be and what that looks like and how those installations are done differently than standard building practices. Um, it also helps that builder maintain quality and oversight throughout the construction process to make sure that we're always hitting those targets and that the certification is not in jeopardy. And then we also have raters and verifies, verifiers, which are is another certification you can get as a person um, through FIAS. And this is required for certification. Again, it's that third party that comes and checks your work to make sure that you uh, the building actually performs as designed. Um, early involvement is always recommended really for any of these people. Um, they are the people that are on site, boots on the ground, making sure that, uh, like I said, we're meeting those targets, doing the blower door tests, et cetera. Um, and they verify the final compliance at the end of the project. And they they also are working very closely with FIAS throughout. So um, these are three team members. Uh, the, the, the rater and verifier is certainly required for the project. Uh, a, a CPHC is is comes in real handy, the, the certified consultant, and a builder is always encouraged as well. So different ways to get expertise in passive house design run through FIAS. Um, certification guidelines, uh, each of the team members needs to be familiar with the guidelines. Uh, they include the moisture control for the walls, roofs, floors, the comfort assessment for windows, um, ventilation systems, et cetera. 
The guidelines provide another, another level of quality assurance, another checkpoint to provide the highest quality of building possible um, through construction. So I've mentioned energy modeling before. A big part of making sure that this whole thing works is doing energy modeling at the beginning and frankly, throughout the design process, which is done through a software called Woofy, funny name, but it's W-U-F-I, Woofy Energy Modeling Software. It's essential um, to the design certification. Um, it provides a whole building energy simulation to determine the building specific annual heating and cooling demand to verify that it is um, gonna meet the FIAS targets. It allows you to test different assemblies, um, for your walls or different mechanical systems. So you can actually use it as a design tool, um, but also does the actual math to make sure that you're going to hit those climate specific targets for heating demand, cooling demand, heating load, cooling load, source and site energy. Um, so these are just more snapshots from the energy modeling software. Um, there are other tools that are needed to analyze different conditions in the building. So we mentioned thermal bridges before. They're allowed. It just means you have to model and account for them. And that's used, that's done using a, a, a software called Therm, um, which is used to analyze that thermal bridging and the construction details. And then that spits out values that then you put into your energy modeling. So it's uh, to your WOOFI model so that it's accounted for in the overall um, energy. Uh, in addition to the basic certification functions, Woofy also has advanced features that can analyze the heat and moisture in your assemblies uh, and determine the likelihood of mold growth, wood rot, corrosion, et cetera. So these are really just good design tools. Uh, again, I know I'm speaking on behalf of an, as an architect, but I think the earlier and more consistently you can use things like this, the better design you're going to have. Uh, both from a performance standpoint, but also that resiliency we were talking about. So thinking about um, moisture uh, control uh, in your envelope. So certification process, it's done in sort of two big steps. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of little steps in between. There's the design certification, which requires the energy model through Woofy, uh, which then is given to FIAS. They review it in-house um, and give you feedback process. So they they help you flag um, where you might have some uh, design considerations that you want to change or modify. Um, and then the final certifications happens through the construction process done by that third party FIA certified rater or verifier. Um, also, there's documentation that's submitted to FIAS that they have to uh, stamp and approve. And then the energy model is then weighed against the as built conditions to, again, show that you actually did all the good work that you planned at the beginning actually translated into the field. So I think just to run through this quickly, at the start of a project, I we really endorse the idea of doing a feasibility study uh, before committing to the whole certification process and contract with FIAS. Um, this can be completed by a CPHC or by FIAS. Um, so it's, it's something to do early at the project to just see if it's the right pathway for you, or maybe it's determining whether you're going to do core versus zero. Um, then the next the next stage is sort of like the first paperwork. Uh, this is when the project team decides or determines which certification they're going to go for. You have to register the project with FIAS, uh, which includes signing a contract uh, with FIAS that creates an entry to the project database um, and paying a certification fee. And so that's done early in design, recommended pre-design or schematic design. Next starts the actual certification process. So that's once it's been, you're added to the project database, you receive a project number, the design team can then proceed with the certification process, which is the design, the modeling, the getting uh, response feedback from FIAS uh, and, and so on. And then, you know, you can repeat that over and over again through design development and construction doc documents. Uh, so, Ideally, this begins, again, earliest is best, but sometimes it does come in in uh, later design development. That's okay, but it's sort of the, the iterative process between the design team, which might include a CPHC um, and FIAS to make sure that your modeling is checking out with uh, your drawings and details that you're um, pr proposing to actually be constructed. And then the 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 
phase three is in construction. Uh, this is when the raider visits the site periodically to verify that the building is being built as designed um, and as previously approved by FIAS through the, the earlier certification uh, stamp of approval. Final certification can then be awarded after construction is complete. All documentation has been verified and submitted by the FIAS certification team. And then you have a FIAS project. Congratulations. So it, it can be a long journey that involves a lot of people, um, but it, it's a really good way of like checks and balances. Um, a lot of times with uh, high performance building, there is not that feedback loop. And so this actually assures that what you're intending to do uh, gets built. So certification is growing. Uh, it's growing rapidly throughout the United States and beyond. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, sessions like this get people excited to maybe join the movement and help reduce overall building energy consumption. Um, as of last year, I think FIAS had certified 3. Point, I'm seeing 3.4 million square feet of uh, building floor area, and I know that number keeps growing. Uh, and I think this is probably old data, but in 2022, certification Certified projects was over 350 projects in North America. So it's gaining traction, and especially with changes to building codes um, and energy codes, like people are going to be turning to FIAS as a, as a methodology and a framework of, of best practice. So get on the, get on the train because it's already moving. Um, let's see. So resources that FIAS has, there's a certification guidebook. This is available on FIAS.org. This sort of runs through everything I talked about today and a whole lot more. Um, there's also a resource library on the website. This is really, really helpful. I turn to this often to find either former articles or case study projects or other sessions that I can watch. Um, and so it's it's a really great database of everything that Theus not only creates and promotes, but um, other, other lessons learned can be found through this resource library, as well as calculators and things like that to actually help you do the work. Um, the, the projects database is also a nice thing to visit because you see how many different projects have been certified, stories that came along with that, teams that actually completed it. So if you're maybe shopping for consultants to work with or architects to work with, you can um, make contacts through that. You can filter the database by type, location, climate zone to find something that is applicable to your project that you're thinking about. Um, a feasibility study, as we mentioned, as part of the process. Uh, FIAS is great about quick turnarounds of things. Five to 10 days can help you uh, determine if this is the right pathway for you. Um, includes the uh, passive energy, or sorry, you do this. Oh yeah, the preliminary energy model of your building is used to assess the current design and its feasibility to achieve uh, FIAS certification uh, based on the size of the building and the type of the building. Um, FIAS provides the trainings for the different types of um, individual certifications, uh, various types of trainings and how they're done either uh, virtually and some are in person. Um, I would check out the website if you're interested in that. Um, and also training on software. So both Woofy and Therm, which are the, the two softwares mentioned that help you do all the modeling. Uh, I'll just say overall, FIAS is a really great organization that offers all kinds of information, very helpful people, um, as well as the types of tools. They only get better and better as the years go on that really help um, all of us working professionals uh, do this good work. Um, and then the FIAS Alliance, which Tom did at the top, int introducing the local chapter of Chicago, uh, is, is a way to sort of engage with like-minded individuals who are trying to learn and promote uh, passive house design. You can become a member at theus.org. It gets you discounted rates on webinars, uh, conference, the annual conference, um, as well as access to office hours with staff um, and the climate data library. So that's all I have to say. That was a mouthful. It's 5.54. We've got time for maybe a few questions. Uh, reminder, this does get you a CEU. If you're a CPHC, you get uh, a, a CPHC CEU, the self-report code is below. Um, and I think if you self-report, you can also get an AIA credit. At least that's what I'm told. Hope I'm not saying that out of turn. So I think that's all I have. So any questions? 
there was one question I see here that came up in the chat. Uh, okay. Since the 2022 Energy Transformation Code listed FIA certification as a compliance method for commercial and residential projects, has there been an uptick in Chicago projects using the framework? Um, I mean, I don't know that I have data on that to yeah. say for sure. I think the interest level is certainly going up. Um, and I, like I said, I think with changing energy codes, people are going to be pivoting to this as a, and, and a lot of uh, new building and energy code adjustments are actually citing FIAS as the way to do it. So, um, but I, I don't, I don't have a way to say like, yeah. has there been an increase? I think so, but I, I don't, I don't have any factoids on that. Yeah. And I would add, it's been growing exponentially. So it's hard to attribute what portion of it went to that, but there was a expressed concern in uh, in the Massachusetts where it was adopted earlier in the code that there was a very dramatic uh, uptick in the look at it, but I don't know if they're feeling that quite as uh, much here yet in mm -hmm. Chicago. We have a couple of hand raised, um, Anthony. Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, great presentation. I watched uh, the YouTube video from last year and it seems like there's a little bit of new update, some cool stuff. The row house with thermal cameras, really cool to see. It really sort of makes it cemented there, appreciate it. And I want to thank BS in general as I've been learning more about this. Uh, I'm just a, a guy who's looking to build a single family passive home sometime in the Chicago <laughs> suburbs. And I'm just trying to learn everything I can. I appreciate you guys having these uh, resources. I want to thank you for the prescriptive path as well. It looks like that's some great work that people like me could really take advantage of. Uh, sure. Just looking for a modest uh, thing. A couple, couple, couple ideas or a couple of things I wanted to spit out there. One, like, I noticed like what might be really helpful for people looking to build modest, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand square foot single family homes might be like some open source house plans that were, you know, FIAS FIAS ready that we could direct our our builders to, and obviously ask them to go through mm -hmm. the certification here as well. And uh, that's just one idea I want to throw out. And I know time is limited. I also want to just mention that like the FIAS. Uh, website in general, like uh, trying to find resources in the area, a lot of them, uh, it, it it doesn't, you can't, you're, you're supposed to be able to pick like if you want a, you know, certifier versus an architect versus a builder, but that doesn't actually work. And then most yeah, of the resources that pop up perfectly. are super old and it's out of date, right? So I just want to bring those things to your attention and ask maybe about what you guys thought about a repository of open source single family homes in this modest area. I mean, I think it's a great idea. It It's sort of working me out of a job though. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, there's always going to be multifamily. I, and there's always I know. Be the I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I, I think it, it. I think it's certainly a, not a bad idea to have sort of like a a template of uh, it could be like plans or typical details or things like that that could work. You know, uh, I think that's a good idea. In fact, I don't. That might exist on the website if anyone knows about it i'd be really interested i yeah. I, I looked i didn't see any specific uh you know mo as i look honestly and i talk to different people who very few people that i can find that actually have experience in the chicago area on this um it's mostly around you know much more extravagant homes than are in my budget right and, and it's, it's just looking for a path to try to do the right thing on an economical scale for mm -hmm. the normal person Mm -hmm. um, it, there's not a lot of data out there. There's not a lot of people to help. So any, anything more we can do to help. There's one builder that looks like they'll be the best uh, in Canada. They do prefab homes. It's called Eco Builds with a with a K. Mm -hmm. and, and they seem like they're very popular and they're they're trying to make it cost effective. But then again, shipping you know tons of cellulose on a semi truck from Canada to Chicago. It seems like there should be a better way, right? So I agree. Thanks. There, there's been a lot of talk about this for a long time. Um, I do know that Illinois Green is working on the Green Building Hub, and they did just release that this year, and it's supposed to be a, a place, a centralized place of um, information, but it's still developing. I'm going to check out. And they, and they have that meeting, uh, like, next week, right, where they're going to talk about that new apartment complex, right? So I could attend yeah. that, find out from those guys. Thanks. Tom, you're speaking at that, right? Yeah, sorry. I missed the last part of the question because I was reading something. Um, <laughs> the Illinois Green event next week, isn't that the thing? You're yes, uh, yes, on January 25th. Yes, that's when I announced at the beginning of the thing. Yes, I'll be a, a, on the panelist discussing the multifamily project, conservatory apartments. Thanks, guys. Does anybody else have a question? They should just shout it out. Hi, this is Laura. I had a question. 
I'm really curious about um, uh, how how garages are taken into consideration for either retrofit or obviously new construction. You know, it, it's interesting with the cold snap we're having in Chicago, there was a um, something on the news just in the last day talking about how um, EV car drivers were caught off guard when they didn't realize that they need to keep at least about a 20% capacity on their battery uh, when they go out, because if it goes below that and you try to recharge in cold weather, you could be stuck. And, and sure enough, there were some Tesla car owners who were very disappointed to have their cars towed. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, is there going to be a recommendation in a cold climate like Chicago that the garage become conditioned space so that EV car owners, uh, you know, they don't go out to their garage overnight when it, there's been a cold snap and they're surprised that, oh my goodness, I can't, you know, my, my car, the battery's dead because it's so cold. So, you know, like, is there any sort of consideration like that or what, what are some thoughts around that? I'll say my EV uh, was pretty low and luckily my detached garage did not get, you know, be way below freezing or whatever it might be, uh, absolute zero to not start. So no problems there. Um, sometimes I question some of these news stories and the sources. Yeah. I, I would think it'd be quite a challenge to start to request that uh, garages be conditioned. Um, especially if they're not attached to the house. I mean, just because of the burden that puts on an effective garage door and everything. Um, it's the first I've kind of heard of this kind of topic coming up. And and I, I am just now recently a EV electric vehicle owner. So I'm uh, feeling the pain too when I'm getting one mile per kilowatt or something. Um, uh, but I, mean, I can yeah, speak to that just a little bit. I mean, the Fias does require that there's EV charging in the garage. And when the car is plugged yes. in, it, it it is able to keep the battery heated up um, overnight. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that's it. actually, but, but you're, you're required to have the charging, but the, the energy for that is not accounted for in the housing mm -hmm. set, uh, kind of the project. It's really a, a transportation uh, energy use. So it's not really, you don't have, you don't pay the penalty of uh, the energy use to charge a car as part of your source energy requirement that uh, Kelly was describing. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of treated like its own separate thing, but in terms of the, need to keep the vehicle warm if the if the charging isn't doing it itself i i don't haven't heard any conversation about that yet mm -hmm. but we'll hear more about it as we have more and more electric vehicle owners uh out there right okay thank you yeah i don't want to pay 350 dollars per square foot for my garage I, the car will keep itself warm if it's plugged in the people in chicago were really having a hard time with uh with, with those are people that are in the shared shared housing and they don't have charging and as their vehicles use twice as much power as they normally would when it's six or 10 below zero, they're all hitting the chargers and the batteries are so cold now that they're outside. They have to actually heat the battery up for it to be able to take a charge. And that's, I think, what you what you mentioned. But most people that have a Fiat house are already going to have power in their garage and their cars are going to be plugged in and they're really not going to have this problem unless they're trying to do a long trip and they come to all these chargers that are completely filled up. But charging home is the key. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Steve Chertok, and I, it's up on the chat. Um, uh, you know, your token real estate agent here. Um, you know, I've, I've been asking this question now for a couple of years, and I know it's been difficult uh, kind of keeping track of this, but I'm just wondering if there, have, if there are any statistics anyone might have that could give us you know, in the real estate marketplace, an idea of the increased value that FIA certification gives to a home. Um, it, it, it's, it, at least to my way of thinking, is a huge value add. And it's something that people actually ask about in the field, in the market, when they're buying a home. Um, you know, it, 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 there's this, you know, sort of existential um, uh, beauty to having a, a Fias home. Um, but in reality, and there's something really very tangible about it as well. And part of that, you know, is, is the improved value to the home. And that's kind of what I'm trying to drive at or yeah. get to. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any, uh, any statistics on that. 
think it's it's a hard thing to quantify. I I've not seen it done in a way where it says, oh, if you have a passive house certified home, it means X dollars or X percent more value as far as are you are you saying like from a sale point? Yeah, right? I, like, I know I, I know that I know that the National Association of Realtors um and the core databases from all the associations now have the designations uh, that can be entered into a listing that designates whether there's a green certification to the home and whatnot. And so it would be a, you know, there, there's, there's some history of this data now. It goes back at least 10 years because that's what's online and available. And it, there may even be a possibility of going further back and it would be very interesting to compare the value of the home, you know, prior to its becoming certified versus what it sold for after it was certified. And that would give us some indication as to the improved market value. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm still on that train and that trail. And if I get something, I'll let you know. Um, yeah. But uh, that's as close as I've been able to come. Or two builders in a subdivision that are building similar square foot sizes that are, you know, right. not certified and are certified. Yeah. What is, what is the follow-up question to that? Great, yeah, that's what a is the, angle also. What is the, the, the I, I don't know, I assume it's reasonable, but like the bare minimum cost to get a VS core certification on a home with a prescriptive path. I, in my mind, it's, it's, it's just a few thousand dollars by the time you have to do the prescriptive spreadsheet, get that okayed, and then get your final uh, testing from a, certified tester, uh, it, it's probably less than 10, I would assume, right? So uh, you have some some kind of, um, on, on a single family, you know, 2,000 square foot home or something. A am I in the right ballpark? Um, well, if I guess if you're just asking like, what is the what is the direct cost of certification? Right, not obviously, about what the are additional the, cost of What the are the actual yeah, right. hard costs that go along with uh, actually having a passive house building. I mean, yeah, you're paying for your rater. You're paying for the actual certification, which is a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and then if, you know, depending on who's designing it or building it or developing it, you're going to need someone to do the energy modeling and think. So there's, there's the design service. Well, with the prescriptive but, route, you don't necessarily. But I, I think, um, you're right. If you're not having to do the energy modeling and you're paying for a rater and the certification, um, I guess real quick to follow up on that question. I see Lindsay Elton is on the call. I'd be curious if, have you done just a prescriptive path core as a rater? And like, I don't know, can we verify what a ballpark is to do that? Maybe she's not hearing me, but I see your name there. Well, I can call Eco Achievers myself too and get that information. <laughs> I sent them an email a few days ago, actually. So I'll wait for them to get back to me. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you at the next one. Yeah, why don't we wrap up here? Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Hope to see you at our next one in February. And um, yeah, look forward to it. Great. Bye, Bye everyone. Now. Have a good evening. Good night.